pretty dire situation that we just read about, yes? yes? So just understand that as we are going through this series that we have entitled Lessons from the Old Testament, it is, how shall I say, not fair if we don't hear something from Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets and he tells of a lot of history that may not be what we always want to read about. It can often be quite depressing. In fact, that is why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. He, in fact, gets very depressed over what he is told to say. And in the end, he says how drained and how upset he is that he has had to now go through what he prophesied would happen. But what I want you to know about Jeremiah as we get started this morning is that he never leaves his people. He always sticks with them. And I'd like to think that as, as, as we look at this uh, history today, that, that we would be like Jeremiah. We would not run away. We would not tell God to be quiet and not talk to us anymore, but that we would be willing to hear from God in these amazing times in which we live. And that even if what God has to say is not the easiest thing to hear, and potentially might even be uh, not uh, something that some of the rest want to hear, and so that if we follow God's commands, we, we end up not having friends. We still want to be like Jeremiah. Our first week this month, we, we, we learned the lesson that we can rely upon God because He already knows the way. So if you weren't here at the first of the month, you can see it on TV. Again, I want to say hello to those on TV. We have a microphone working now. I'm sorry it wasn't working a moment ago for, for prayer, but I know that there are several people, some of which were in hospital this week, who decided to stay home and uh, to watch us to be a part of our congregation on TV. And we do have that option. If you ever need it, go to SantaClaritaSDA.org and click on, and you can watch from home if you need to. The second week this month, we learned uh, when Jordan and I were presenting that God meets you where you are. He doesn't ask us in many respects to bridge that gap between who he is and who we are. He says, I will come to you. I will meet you where you are. Last week uh, was fun uh, because uh, oftentimes uh, you, you see the humor with which God leads us. And it can be very surprising. So last week we learned that God surprises us. I don't know if you are part of what tends to be a growing group in our midst and or in other parts of Christianity where you believe maybe that God does not bring Adversity. There are some who believe that. I believe that they're going to be surprised today. They're going to be surprised by what we learn in the book of Jeremiah. You may have brought your Bible with you this morning. If you didn't, there is a pew Bible in front of you. I suggest that you turn to Jeremiah uh, 36. We're going to be covering a lot of ground, and I, I, I just want you to know that it's it's, it's a long and sordid story, so hang on tight. I will try to make it G-rated, but I'm going to tell you that when you read this as an adult and you understand the, in, the inference of a lot of what is said here, this is not a G-rated story. This is, this is an NC-17 rated story. Okay? So that's not how it will come across from me today, but I suggest that you do your own uh, adult in-depth reading of this passage and understand 
that God, as we have learned, meets us where we are, and sometimes He's not happy. He's not happy with what is going on. If you turn back to chapter uh, 36, actually, is where we're going to begin today, you find uh, that in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all other nations from the time I began speaking to you to the reign of Josiah till now. This is verse 3. And it begins in the New International Version here with the word perhaps. Maybe you have another word. But I want, you to, I, I want you to grab a hold of that word from a, a truly English language perspective for just a moment and realize that that word is related to happenstance. That big word that's related to circumstance. So here God uses, okay, this is God speaking. Here God uses the word perhaps. And I want you to, I want you to just... Connect for this very moment through this one word with God's heart. Because he's speaking to Jeremiah now and he wants to grab a hold of the hearts of the people of Israel. So again, in this story, you can, you can see several characters developing. You can see God on the one hand and Jeremiah on the other and then the people of Israel and the people of Judah as well. So please be aware that in this in this whole story, there are different components and that you may be blessed by understanding more from each of those perspectives. But it may take you several times to go through this, playing a different role. But for the moment, I want you to see this from God's perspective. And he uses the word, perhaps, maybe. Can you feel the hope? Can you... Can you maybe relate to the fact that God, as our Heavenly Father, has hopes and dreams for us. So I, I thought that it would be very important for you to grab a hold of that concept at the very beginning of this because it is going to get depressing. It is going to get harsh. But I want you to know that from the very beginning of this passage, he says, perhaps, maybe, I hope. So I want, you to, I want you to feel that emotion in God's heart right now. Perhaps when the people of Judah, this is verse 3 of chapter 36 of Jeremiah, perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them. Now that wasn't the devil he was talking about, was it? Just checking with you. Okay. Each of them will turn from their wicked way. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. Quick definition of sin that I work with every day. I hope it will become your definition as well. The definition of sin that I have is a broken relationship with God. Sins are those actions that proceed from a broken relationship with God. Comprendes? If you are in relationship with God, the actions that flow from that are righteousness. If you are not in relationship with God, the actions that flow from your life are sins. So when we, we come to church and we, we ask forgiveness for our sins, Sins, and we ask for healing of our relationship back together with God because then we will be in righteousness, no? Yeah. Then I will forgive their wickedness and their sin. So Jeremiah called Baruch. He calls Baruch who is a scribe who, whose, whose skill is writing writing in Hebrew, and, and, and so he writes, and he writes these words. I, uh, basically, uh, Jeremiah says, I'm restricted. I, I cannot go and go to the house of the Lord and read these, so you go, and verse 7, here's that word again, perhaps, 
And now this is Jeremiah speaking about the people of Israel. Perhaps they will bring their petition to the Lord and each will turn from his wicked ways for the anger and wrath pronounced against this people by the Lord are great. Is great. Okay? So Jeremiah becomes this instrument. He becomes this conduit of the Lord who speaks to him and says, this is what is going to happen to my people who have broken their relationship with me and are worshiping other gods, are living their life outside of a relationship with me. And, and, and so this is what I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell them. This is what I'm going to do to them. So this, what this brings up in my mind is, I don't know. I'm going to go from my own experience. I'm in the grocery store as a kid. And I'm, I'm, touching, I'm touching things. And, and mom says, don't touch that. And I do it again. And mom says, don't touch that or you'll get the wooden spoon at home. Okay, parents, I know you're giggling because we all understand this. Uh, it's a new day and age. And there are those, including my brother and his family, who is younger than I am, who decided there wouldn't be any such statements. However, there have been times when uh, there, there, there have been some pretty amazing timeouts, and there have been some deprivation of uh, video games and, and other uh, it, it, beautiful things that kids get to play with. And, and so if they did it again, those things would be taken away. We make these pronouncements as parents, so we are very familiar with the feeling with the feeling that God must have had as he speaks to Jeremiah, who then tells Baruch to write these things down and go to church and read them. This is what Baruch has to do, and so he, he does this. He does this, and then the people in the government, the people in, in the leadership of Israel hear about it, and they tell him to bring the scroll to them. So he brings the scroll to them, and they read it. And then what happens is that they are so scared by what they hear that they tell Baruch to go back and tell Jeremiah, go and hide. Go and hide. And they take the scroll and they put it into the secretary's office. Now, the king finds out. And the king says, bring me the scroll. They didn't hide the scroll. They put it in the secretary's office. So they went and got the scroll. And they bring the scroll. And they start, he says, read it to me. Now I want you to, want you to look in your Bibles. Because this, I mean, this needs to be made into a movie. Come on. This needs to be made into a movie. In the ninth month, of the, the king was sitting in the winter apartment. He's in Jerusalem. And he's got a summer apartment. And, a, you know, it's the king, right? He's in the winter apartment with the fire burning in the fire pot in front of him. We'd probably call it a chimenea or something. When, whenever Jehudi had read three or four columns of the scroll, he's having the scroll read to him, he would read three or four columns of the scroll. The king cut off with the scribe's knife a piece of the scroll and threw it in the fire pot. Now these are the words of the Lord. And this is the king listening to them. The king and all his attendants, this is verse 24 of chapter 36 of Jeremiah, the king and all his attendants who heard all these words showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes. These were the signs. In, 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 when you read Bible stories and, and you see people and they, they tear their clothes, this, this, this is like, why, why would you do that? You don't really have that many clothes in your closet. Uh, but they would tear their clothes because to tear your clothes was a, an outward sign of your grief, your fear, your desire to, to, to get right with God. Well, nothing of that happened. Instead, the king commanded Jeremiel, son, uh, a son of the king, Sariah, son of uh, uh, Azrael, and Shelemiah, son of Abdiel, to arrest Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But this is the neat thing. But the Lord had hidden them. 
That was probably the last time, though. After the king burned the scroll containing the words that Baruch had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Are you ready? <laughs> you might think that you can get rid of the word of the Lord, but watch what happens. Take another scroll. <laughs> Jeremiah's thinking, I did this once, Lord. Look what he did. Uh, no, take another scroll and write on it all the words that were on the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, son, uh, king of Judah, burned up. Also tell Jehoiakim, king of Judah, this is what the Lord says. You burned that scroll and said, why did you write on it what the king of Babylon would certainly come and destroy this land and cut off both men and animals from it? He actually asked that question. Why did you do this? Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He will have no one to sit on the throne of David. His body will be thrown out and exposed to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. I will punish him and his children and his attendants for their wickedness. I will bring them and those in Jerusalem and the people of Judah every disaster I pronounced against them because they have not listened. I told you this would be depressing. Can you imagine being Jeremiah and having to deliver these words? So Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to the scribe Baruch, son of Neriah. And as Jeremiah dictated, Baruch wrote on it all the, king, all the words the king of Judah had burned in the fire, and many similar words were added to it. Well, the story goes on. The story goes on, and the fact is that there is a prophecy that Jeremiah brings that says the Babylonians are going to come and they are going to destroy Jerusalem. They're going to, to take all of your family and, 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 and do bad things to them. And then they're going to catch up with you. And they're going to, the, 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 you're, you're not going to get away. You're going to be taken captive. They didn't listen. They, they, they just keep not listening. Okay? So I'm in, verse, I'm in chapter 37 now. Uh, and, and verse 7. This is what the Lord said, to God of Israel says, tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of me, Pharaoh's army, which has marched out to support you, will go back to its own land, to Egypt. Then the Babylonians will return and attack the city. They will capture it and burn it down. In those days, Israel and Judah would make alliances with the big nations around them so that they could keep, keep the peace in some respects. And what had happened was that Israel had made a, an, an alliance with Egypt Egypt and the king of Egypt marched out to support Israel in their time of need against the Babylonians. The Babylonians heard about it and they withdrew. But Jeremiah sends a, another message and says, look, they're not going to stay away. These troublesome Babylonians are not going to stay away. They're going to come back. And when they come back, they're going to destroy the place. So if you got a message like that, if, if we got a message like that, okay, just this week we were hearing about the, 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 the hurricane or the, or the storm that was supposed to hit Hawaii. We're very glad that it went past Hawaii, even though it's dumped a lot of rain on Hawaii, okay? We're really glad that it didn't smash right into Hawaii, right? Okay, but if we knew that it was coming and we didn't take precautions to be away from the gullies and the ravines and, and, and places where water could rise, how would, what, would we think, what would we think of the people of Hawaii if they didn't take precautions? Well, now, now you're feeling what God must have been feeling as he tells the people of Judah the Babylonians are going to come back and they're going to destroy your city. You need to leave. Jeremiah is not stupid. Jeremiah gets his things and he leaves. He tries to leave. He's going to go up to Benjamin in the north part, of Jerusalem, north part of Israel, and he is going to live there. And so what is he going to do? He's leaving through the Benjamin gate, and as he's leaving, he's apprehended. And he is accused of going over to the Babylonians. You're deserting. You're going over to one of them. You're... And what happens is a captivity begins for him, and he is thrown into a dungeon. This is at the end of verse 37. Finally, several months later, the king summons him 
and says, what has God told you? Can you imagine the audacity of a king who has imprisoned the prophet for saying what God told him to say, and now he wants to see whether or not there's something different that God has told him to say? But he doesn't have anything different to say. He just says, you will be handed over to the king of Babylon. Then Jeremiah said to the king, what crime have I committed against you and your officers and, and this people that you have put me in prison? Where are your prophets who prophesied that the king of Babylon will not attack this land? But now, my lord, the king, please listen. Let me bring my petition before you. Do not send me back to the house of Jonathan, the secretary, or I will die there. This is a prison. This was a, a house that had been made into a prison, and he was in bad shape. And so instead, they put him in the courtyard. Now, you might think he's outside. No, no. The courtyards of the houses built in Jerusalem have porticos under which people can live, and that is where they put uh, Jeremiah. But then worse things happen. This is what the Lord says, verse 2 of chapter 38. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine or plague, but whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life, and he will live. How do I say this? Here we sit on a Sabbath, a seventh day, not a first day, a seventh day. I don't know if you've had trouble in your life from people who say, why do you, why do you go to church on the seventh day? Why don't, you, why don't you come to church with me on the first day? Here you, have, here you have a person who is trying to tell a whole group of his own people what is going to help them, what is going to save them. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have been convicted, in fact, one of these times is now. I have been convicted that the message that the Seventh-day Adventist Church preaches, maybe the, the package deal is, is how I like to say it, the package of the gospel and of understanding about obedience to God, that is something that is very important to tell people. Because there are things that are coming there are times that are coming. There are prophecies like the ones here in Jeremiah that are telling us about the future. And they, they need, we need our friends and our loved ones to know these things. We are going to be certainly hopeful that they will listen because these are messages that we believe have been given to us by the God of heaven. So in that sense, when you hear what is happening to Jeremiah in his book here, when you... When you Picture this in your mind. I, I want you to know that this same kind of action, the same kind of situation has happened to every people whom God has called to tell the prophecies of the future. Prophecies that don't sit well with people who don't want to do what those prophecies ask them to do. It might change their lives. It, it might mean that because the Babylonians are coming, that you're going to have to leave. But you'll, you'll live. You'll live, right? And you want to live. Oh, yeah, but I don't want to go. You know, I like it here. Oh, those Babylonians, they won't come back. See what happened when the Egyptians came? Oh, they, they won't come back. How many, times, how many times have you heard these kinds of statements when you have said to people, you know, the God of heaven created the world in seven days and on the seventh day he rested and, 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 and Sabbath is a memorial of his creative power. You believe in his creative power. Oh yes, I believe in his creative power. So why don't you come and worship with me on the seventh day? Oh, but you know, uh, uh, I, I, I never have, uh, you know, uh, my mom, you know, she always worshiped... Uh, Need I, need I say more? Uh, this was then. 
This is now. Same stuff. And Zedekiah gave orders for Jeremiah to be placed in the courtyard of the guard and given bread from the street in the bakery each day until the bread was all gone. So Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. Shephatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pashur, and several others, long names. This is what the Lord says. This is now chapter 38, verse 2. Whoever stays in the city will die by the sword, famine, or plague, but whoever goes over to the Babylonians... This is, not, this is not a politically correct stance. What? Give up to the enemy? Give up to the Babylonians? Throw yourself at their feet and their mercy? And this is what the Lord says, this city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon who will capture it. Then the official said to the king, this man should be put to death. This Jeremiah, he is discouraging the soldiers who, left in, who are left in the city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. You ever been accused of that? Just for being a Christian? There are some pretty famous people who believe that those of us who believe that there is going to be a fiery end to this world are dangerous. Have you ever thought of yourself as dangerous just for believing that God is going to end this world in fire? He's going to recreate it and make it new again? If you believe that today, there are individuals who believe that you're a dangerous person, that you do not have the good of this country or this world in mind because you see it coming to a fiery end. Better put you in prison. Take you out of the equation. Then the official said to the king, uh, this man should be put in prison. And what does the king do? I, I think this guy Zedekiah has, has a backbone like a jellyfish. <laughs> the king said, you can do anything you want with him. He's in your hands. Mm. What? What? So they took Jeremiah and put him into the cistern at Malkijah, of Malkijah, the king's son, uh, which was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. The cistern didn't have any water in it, the Bible says. It only had mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. I don't know if you've got a picture in your mind like I do right now, but I've got a picture of quicksand. I've got a picture of Jeremiah there up to his neck in mud, not able to move, no one to take him out in a dark, deep cistern at the bottom of the world. But God had a man. I don't know. I don't know whether God has called upon you as a man or a woman, whether God is calling upon you in these crazy times in which we live to be the kind of guy that Ebed Melech was. Ebed Melech. It says he was a Cushite. Raise your hand if you know who and what the Cushites were. Good, I can teach you something this morning. You have to read your genealogy in Genesis and you will find out that Cush was one of the close relatives to Abram and his descendants inhabited Africa. To this day, this word is used in Hebrew to describe Africans. So here you have an African Jew who is a courtier a ro in the royal palace who heard that this had been done to Jeremiah, and he goes to the king and says, now this is, this is where I think the king has a spine like a jellyfish, because he's just said yes to this group over here that want to kill Jeremiah, and now here comes Ebed Melech, a Cushite, an official of the royal palace, had heard that they'd put Jeremiah in the cistern, and this is uh, verse 7, while the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, Ebed Melech went out to the palace and said to him, my lord the king, these men have acted wickedly, 
in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into the cistern where he will starve to death and where there is no longer, when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Cushite, take 30 men with you from here and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. Thank God the king came to his senses. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and they went to the room and look, 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 look at the tenderness. Look at the tenderness that happens here. He put some old rags, some worn out clothes, and he let them down uh, with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. And he yells down to him, put these old rags, these worn out clothes under your arms to pad them. Because I don't know if you have ever pulled your foot out of some sucky mud. What happens? It sucks your shoes off. All right? So if, if Jeremiah is at least up to his chest in mud, it is going to be painful to pull him out because of the suction. There's no one down there to break the suction for him. And so they're going to have to slowly, you know, he's going to get a back extension is what's going to happen. And Ebed Melech knows this. And so he says, put these rags, put these clods under your arms because it's going to hurt, but we're going to get you out of here. Jeremiah did so and they pulled him out with the ropes and they lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained where he had been before in the courtyard of the gods, the guards. I want you to know that Jeremiah has to deal with the politics that the king has to deal with. And in, verse, in, in, in the rest of verse, chapter 38, we, we realize that, that when Zedekiah in, in, ver, in chapter ni, verse 19 excuse me, says to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Jews who have gone over to the Babylonians, for the Babylonians may hand me over to them and they will mistreat me. So you see, he was dealing, the king was dealing with political factions in the church, in his own, in his own uh, group. Some had gone over to the Babylonians and some had decided to stay in Jerusalem and not give over to the Babylonians. And he was partial maybe to that group because they were the ones who were supporting him as king. And so he is having to, to decide whether he's going to listen to Jeremiah and the word of the Lord and give over to the Babylonians or whether he's going to stay with the other political group who says, no, we've got to stick it out. We don't believe the Babylonians are coming back. Verse 22, all the, all the women left the palace. The king of Judah was brought out by the officials of the king of Babylon. This verse tells you that the king has now captured, captured Jerusalem. And what, he, what God prophesied is, is happening. The women and children are being brought out and paraded in front of the Babylonians. They misled you and overcame you, those trusted friends of yours. Your feet, <laughs> isn't this amazing, the, the, the irony here? Your feet are sunk in the mud, Zedekiah. Your indecision, your unwillingness to follow the, 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 the advance warning of God have found you stuck in the mud, just like Jeremiah was. My friends, it, it, it goes on, and, and, and for the fact that we cannot deal with everything today, I'm going to go to the end and tell you that the intrigue in the middle has to do with uh, a guy named Gedaliah. And Gedaliah is made uh, ruler over uh, Judah. He is then killed by one of his rivals, who then abuses the people, Another man is brought to, the, brought to the fore and he rescues those people. So it goes back and forth. And at that time, they become afraid of the Babylonians again. You can understand that if a people uh, does things that are going to upset the government over them, that they might think about leaving the country. And so just as we... Wrap this up. Let's turn to the end of Jeremiah 41. 
Because they had killed Gedaliah, they decided, Johanan and his group decided that they better go to Egypt. They better flee to Egypt. I wanted to bring this up today because of the picture that we chose for the front of your bulletin. So if you want to look at your bulletin, uh, I had Amy choose this picture. It's, it's an old one, but it is, it is a picture of the prophecy that we read about this morning coming true. Jeremiah tells them, don't go to Egypt. Don't rely upon Egypt to save you. Choose to rely upon God. Throw yourself on the mercy of the Babylonians. They will not kill you. Now, you're, you're there in Judah, you're there in Israel, <laughs> and you've seen the Babylonians destroy Jerusalem, you've seen what they have done, and now the prophet is saying, don't run away, stay. Don't go down to Egypt. Do you see how hard this is? And, and, and I, I don't know about you, but I, I, the, those, those of you who I've talked to, maybe a little more, I, I know that some of you are going through some hard things. Some of, you, some of you are having to make decisions between two difficult things. And I, and I want you to know that, that God knows that. And really, the only thing that, that I can tell you that comes out of Jeremiah today, it, the lesson that you could learn from Jeremiah is, listen, listen to what God is telling you. Amen. It, may not, it may not seem like the politically correct thing to do. It may not seem like the natural thing to do. You've got the Babylonians coming, and we killed the judge that they put over us, and so, of course, they're going to punish us, right? I mean, you know, as a child, you know how that felt. I know how that felt. I knew if I got a spanking at school, I was going to get a spanking at home. And the day came in second grade when that happened. Yes, she was beautiful. She was a very large woman, and she gave me a spanking. But my mother told me that my face, my face was so white on the way up the driveway that she had mercy upon me. But you see, there are tough things that are happening to so many of us right now that when I contemplated telling this story today, I was, I was heartened by the fact that I know that you know that if we listen to God, He knows the way. He'll meet you where you are. He may even surprise you. And, and, and that He is willing, He is willing to teach you about Himself through the circumstances of life. And he's really, really hoping that perhaps you will listen and that he won't have to bring about the disasters that he will use to, to shape and direct your life if necessary. But he, but he really doesn't want to. He really doesn't want to. He wants very much for you to live in the peace and joy that he, he provides and the protection that he provides. I mean, look at Jeremiah. When they, when they went looking for him the first time, God hid him. Have you thought maybe this week that God may have hidden you from some disaster? Because you were following you were in his will. You were doing what he asked you to do. I, I don't know, but what pops to mind, I know Eric's going to like this, what pops to mind is count your blessings, count them one by one. Did you do that this week? One of the blessings could be, God, you protected me when I didn't even know that I needed protecting. How about that? Okay? <laughs> We have friends 
Some of you know them, the castles. We're praying for them, dad and son. God bless you. Amen. Dad's fighting for his life. Amen. Son has broken big bones, not the little bones, the femur. Two of them. Head on collision with an F 150 at night. No lights, so no braking. So 60 plus 60 is? Yes. The physicists tell us that's a crash at 120 miles an hour. <laughs> yes, we're praying. Yes, we have sent some relief to our church members who have recently moved north. Yes, we could say, God, why didn't you make him swerve? Why? Ah, okay. So the Babylonians came. What are you going to do? The F-150 hit them head on and they were driving a, a Dodge Caravan that had been fixed up for the mother. One of those medical vans. So maybe it had a bit more strength and was able to protect them more. I don't know. And if they'd been in some other car, maybe they would have been killed outright. Oh, by the way, the drunk driver in the F-150 is also in critical condition in ICU. So we, we don't know what God protected us from this week. So yes, my friends, we should be singing every week. Count your, God, I count my blessings yes. that I am in your will, that I am one of your people and that you have sent your prophets to tell us of the way in which we should go by the stories that we see here, which are grotesque and gruesome and terrible in so many ways, but also tell us of a God who says, perhaps, perhaps, they will listen and they will live. My friends, we, we, we've said today that, that uh, at least I've said, God loves you. God is willing to teach you and sometimes through painful experiences, but that he is also ready and willing to rebuild you. And the story that ends with this picture is one that says there will be a remnant. It'll be a very small one who will come out of Egypt. But Babylon is going to burn Egypt. <clears throat> don't go to Egypt. <clears throat> don't, don't trust that your life will be okay if you trust in Egypt. Trust in me, God says. So I don't know what that means in your life today. I don't know how the Holy Spirit is going to make that real in your life today. But I want you to be open. I pray that you will be open to letting the Holy Spirit say, trust in me. Trust in the way that I will lead you and you will not come to ruin. These terrible things will not happen to you. You will live. You will be in my house and I will be your God. Amen. Amen.